the EU is facing all these problems. We know Russian revanchism, you know, the refugee crisis, um, terrorism. But if you had to boil the EU's problems down to one thing, upon which all these other things, or some of these other things, could be alleviated, it would be structural economic reform. Um, and structural economic reform is necessary, ironically, because of the social welfare state. After World War II, the only, the, the main political economic response to the sufferings of two world wars and the devastate, human devastation was the creation of a humane social welfare state. Uh, the problem has been that except in the most efficient and dynamic North European societies, the social welfare state, as it is presently constituted, is impossible to afford. And that's what's been the real drag on the European economy. And because of that, you have zero growth. And with zero growth, populations are less willing to absorb new immigrants, especially Muslim immigrants. If you had a 5% growth rate in Europe economically, the attitude towards Muslim migrants would be much different than it is now. But it isn't. It's zero. They're flatlining. And a main reason why they're flatlining is because of the failure of structural reform, which itself is, you know, is based on the difficulty of sustaining this level of a social welfare state. The EU is also very ambitious, I learned uh, researching this book, because it encompasses all these different empires with different cultural and, more importantly, economic and development traditions. You have if you look at all, what are the most important cities in the EU? Maastricht, The Hague, Strasbourg, Brussels. What geography is this? This is Charlemagne's empire. This is the Carolinian empire from the ninth century. Starts at the North Sea, goes south towards Switzerland, has some branches in Milan and northern Italy, over to Frankfurt. This is still the heart of Europe uh, um, after uh, 1,200 years, the Carolinian Empire. And then you have the Prussian Empire, Berlin, which is the new, the new power. Then you have the Habsburg Empire, and I'll get to that at the end of my talk. But at the other extreme, you have Mediterranean Europe, and you have Balkan, Ottoman, Byzantine Europe. Whether it's Romania, it's Bulgaria, it's Serbia, it's, um, it's Macedonia, and it's Greece. It's not an a pure accident that the most troubled part of the Eurozone is at its southeastern corner, a part of Europe that was, you know, Greece being the poor stepchild of, Oz of Ottoman and Byzantine despotism, <coughs> rather than of the Carolinian Empire. That, you know, Greece is the most least well bureaucratized state in Europe in terms of institutions. The modern political parties, which didn't fully revolve around charismatic personalities, didn't develop in Greece till the 1980s or so. Um, Greece is just, you know, is, is institutionally far behind um, in that sense. So the, a united Europe takes in four or five um, imperial traditions, all with different development patterns. Um, now, when you look at Europe, here's the thing. Focus on France, because France is the pivot state. Um, because France encompasses both Northern Europe and Mediterranean Europe. It's big. It's almost as big as Germany. But it's not nearly as economically healthy as Germany. It's almost as economically troubled as Italy, uh, uh, um, for instance. So fr whichever way France goes will help determine the future of the, uh, of the Eurozone.